Good morning, and we read that you're here. Some of you at home, some may be on your phone, some may be just taking a walk and listening as you go. We're still in this uh, COVID-19 Viral Separation Act, and uh, we are not supposed to get together with more than two or three people, maybe. And so we're trying to comply and hope that soon we'll be able to go back to work as we had before and associating with care and not continue to spread this terrible disease that's taken the lives of so many. But it's a beautiful Sabbath morning and through the, though things are very chaotic and uh, with the I-19 virus and the current economic problems in our country and most countries around the world today, I want you to know that God is still in control of all the affairs of men. God does not sleep. The Bible says he owns the world and he takes care of all of his creatures. Today we will see distress of nations and we see great perplexity. But today we are one Sabbath closer to the second coming of Jesus. The only permanent solution to the problem of sin and the problems that it brings. It is, in the last days, the Bible says, there are going to be lots of lawlessness until he comes. There's going to be lots of problems until he comes. And according to the scriptures, it's going to get worse, not get better. But we need to remember, God said, I can take care of you. So this morning, we want to briefly review some of the signs of Jesus' soon return. But I want to focus on just two in particular. And they're both found in Matthew 24. And so we're going to stop for a second and ask God to bless us and guide us because I need that guidance every day. God will speak through me and I don't run my mouth and just say what I think. I want to share God's word. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much that we have the privilege of coming together even though we're separated our minds are together as we lift our hearts towards heaven. Today is your special day and we just ask that you help your people, wherever they'll be found, to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And then bless each one according to their special needs. Some are grieving, some are needing work, some might even be sick. So grant them their special need just for today and Lord, for me, I ask... Hide me and speak through me, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's start with the text that's found in Matthew 24. And we're going to look at just verses 7 and 8. It's a very well-known text, or at least we've referred to it many times. I'd like to read the signs that are there and stop on one. And that is Matthew 24, and we're looking at verse 7 and then verse 8. Verse 7 says... For nations will rise against nation, we see that happening today, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines, we have heard of those things the last many years, and pestilence, and that's where we're going to focus, and earthquakes, we've heard them too, in various places. And then at verse 8 it says, all these are the beginnings of sorrows. So that means when we have a big earthquake, it doesn't mean that Jesus is coming next week. Or some of the other, as that is mentioned there, it talks about pestilence, it talks about famines. But when these things become more frequent and more pronounced, we need to begin taking, taking note. So today I want to look at two. One is, the first one is in, the, 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 the sign is pestilence. Now what is pestilence? Pestilence is another word the Bible uses for sickness, for disease, for Problems that we experience in our community, mostly reference, we're referencing to disease. And so I'm go, I went back and I looked in the computer, I mean, I looked up on the internet, did some research, and I found that we're from, from the year 5,000, not 5,000, 500, 500 AD, coming forward to our time, how many pandemics have we had? And so I haven't going to spend a lot of, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on each one, but I want to name them for you. And so in each one of these pandemics, you know, you want to run, remember that each one that came into being was responsible for the lives of thousands and several of them, millions of people around the world. So I'm going back to the first one in 500 AD, 
to this time. Number one, the plague of Justinian was the Black Death, or the Black the the bubonic plague, and it was came about in 541 to 542, and it wiped out a lot of people back then. That's 541 to 542. But the next big pandemic didn't come again until the year 1346. That was called the Black Death. 1346 through 1353. That's a total of almost uh, eight years. And that's seven years. It's a long time for a plague to be taking people's lives, and it took a lot of lives back there in Europe. Then we head to Central America, and it says here that the Ademic, the, the Cococcolti, and I can't hardly say that word, epidemic, and it was not a pandemic, it was an epidemic in Central America primarily, it says the American plagues are a cluster of the Eurasian diseases brought to the Americas by European explorers. This is time of the exploration. These illnesses included smallpox and then contributed to the collapse of the Inca and the Aztec civilizations. And some estimates are that they wiped out almost 90% of the population of the Western Hemisphere at that time. That's a serious pandemic. But it came in the year 1545 to 1548. That's three years but it's a couple of hundred years after the previous one. Then we go down to the plague of London, 1665 to 1666. One year, again, many, many thousands of people were killed, died because of the plague. Then we have what we call the plague of Marseille, I guess, you say. I think it's a French word, but I have here it in 1720 to 1723. Again, you have a couple of hundred years, a hundred years or so between the two, almost a hundred years. We move on down to 1770 to 1772, we have the Russian plague. There's nobody exempt from pestilence. Wherever you live in the world, you're going to have it. But here it is, a marvelously large, infectious plague of a disease that claimed the lives of millions of people. Then we have the yellow fever epidemic in Philadelphia, in this country, back in 1773. And that took several thousands of lives, not millions, but this is confined to this place, but it's a significant uh, disease, pestilence, if you please. And then we got the flu pandemic. We're coming down to our time, almost to 1900. In 1889 to 1890, we had this flu pandemic. And this one, they tell me, claimed the lives of millions of people around the world. Now, we're going to come to our last decade, last century, 1900 to 1999. Now we've had eight major pandemics from the year 500 to 1900. Now we're going from 1900 to 1999. And we got almost the same number within that one century. Notice what it says. The American polo, polio edemic, ectem, uh, epidemic, pardon me. The American polio epidemic in 1916, and that claimed the lives of a lot of people in this country. Then we have in 18, I mean in 1918 through 1919, a flu pandemic, and this was around the world. The Spanish flu, it killed 50 million, including 675,000 in this country, the U.S., and it was caused by the H1N1 virus. And they say, it, they think it came from some bunch of birds. Wherever it came from, it did some significant damage to our world and to our population here in America. Then in 1957, we had the, another flu pandemic, the Asian flu. That was caused by the H2N2 virus, a influenza strain A. And again, they said the origin was some kind of bird. And they said a million died, including 116,000 here in America. So we're having a lot of pestilence. And the Bible says that's one of the signs that we're coming nearer and nearer to Jesus coming. And then the next one after the Asian flu was 1968, the Hong Kong flu. Now, most of these I can remember at least from 1957 forward. These are in my lifetime. 
1968, the, the flu pandemic, the Hong Kong flu caused by the H3N2 influenza A virus. And again, they say it came from birds. But it killed a million people, including 100,000 in our country. And then we have one that is still going on. It began way back there in 1980s. I think it was first identified as a virus or as, as a cause of a problem that we, the community would experience in 1976. HIV and AIDS pandemic, and that's still ongoing today, since the 1980s, when it really got to be going good, which was not good for us. The AIDS pandemic is ongoing, and since its inception, it has been responsible for the deaths of 37.9 million people around the world. And it's still in place. Today they tell me there are about 30,000 people that are living with AIDS, most of them in Africa. And they found ways now to prolong the shortness of life for those people that contract this disease. But they haven't found a cure yet. So that's up through 1999. Now we're going across into the year 2000. From 2000 to the present, pandemics. Now in the year, in the, in the century before us, we have four, five pandemics, or five significant pestilences that affected our country, the United States, and many other countries around the world. But now we're into 2000 this way, and in 2000, 2003, we have another disease coming called SARS, similar to COVID-19 virus, and it caused the deaths of 774 people and infected 8,098. Why mention SARS? Because it was something that was new. We had never heard of that before. And so that comes in this, this uh, century, 2000 and forward. Then in 2009, we had another pandemic called the swine flu. Most of you remember that one. It originated in the United States and it caused by the virus called H1N1 PDMO9. Now, I don't know what these symbols mean, but the scientists know that's how it was identified. And then in 2018, 2019, the CDC estimated that there had been 60 million cases of this uh, swine flu in this country, and it caused the deaths of 12,469, according to the CDC. But then we move on to another in this last 20 years. In 2012, the Mars outbreak, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, is a member of the coronavirus family. And who, the World Health Organization, has confirmed that about 2,500 cases of the MERS disease, of which occurred in Saudi Arabia, and 861 deaths as of December this last year. The virus probably originated, it says, in bats. They aren't sure. They think, probably. You remember just a few years, a few years back, 2014, we have the Ebola infection disease epidemic that helped and hurt a lot of people over in Northern Africa, West Africa. The largest epidemic so far occurred in West Africa of this particular Ebola problem. The outbreak began, the outbreak began in the forests of southwestern Guinea, Guinea and spread to Liberia, Sierra Leone, and there are 28,600 reported cases. And you remember back a few years back, that was in the news almost every day. How it was spreading, how are they going to contain it? But then we come down to our year, 2000, no, well, last year, really, and we learned about COVID-19, this pandemic. I looked yesterday to see that the, the scores were, or the numbers were, for a few countries. And to date, as of yesterday, according to the World Health Organization, they have a website that gives a tracking of the deaths. And I'm saying that it says the world, by last yesterday, on the 15th or the 15th, 16th of, of uh, April, it was 2,056,000 
368 cases recorded. Of that number, 133,087 have died. In the United States, as of a couple of days ago, we had 636,000 cases and 28,326 deaths reported as of two days ago. Spain, similar numbers, 177,000 cases, 18,000 deaths, 18,700. And that's sufficient for that specific problem. Pestilence, we can say the Bible says in the last days, there are going to be pestilence. Now this is just the big ones. But there are smaller epidemics in smaller places that are more contained. These have crossed borders most of the time. But there's another sign that Jesus is still coming. I want us to read this verse carefully because it has some very specific things to say. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 14. And it says, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. So the preaching of the gospel is also a sign that we're close to the end. Now let's go back and review how this has happened since the time of Christ. When Jesus was, in this version, let me, let me read this here from several different versions. I have the Amplified Version, the New American Standard Version, the NIV. And this one we just read to you was the New King James. And I want to focus on that last part. And then the end will come. Amplified Version, then will come the end. New American Standard Version, then the end will come. NIV says, then the end will come. Every version says, then the end will come, or in the very way of say, different ways of saying the same thing. But they don't say it might come. It doesn't say it could come. It are very emphatic in saying it will come when the gospel has been preached to the world. Now, let's look at the proclamation of the gospel from the time of Jesus till now. When Jesus walked on the earth, he was the spokesman, and the Bible says he went about proclaiming the good news, the gospel of the kingdom, for the kingdom of God has come. That was the kingdom of grace. Okay? The time when we can accept Christ, have our sins forgiven, and have him transform our life in preparation for our, our habitation with him in the heavenly courts. When he died rose and returned to heaven, he left a commission to the disciples. Take this gospel to the world. Well, they did the best they could. The mediums that they had to work with was their mouth. And so they met together in small groups or individuals, and they told the story of Jesus. And they spread out, and then they kept, you tell somebody, and I'll tell somebody, and then they got that person to tell somebody, and body, and then person to a person, and so the gospel spread and Paul said in his writings that it had gone to the whole known world in his day. That was word of mouth. But we come down several, a whole millennia, a whole thousand plus years, till there's a change in the methodology of proclaiming the gospel. Up until that time, it was told from person to person, person to groups. But then they invented the printing press back in 1840. The first book to be printed off that press was the Bible. And now with the printing press, they could print Bibles. They had the entire story of, the, of God's revelations to man. They could print tracts. They could print magazines. They could print books written to help people understand and accept the gospel. And that happened and continued to happen through books and magazines and tracts and Bibles, giving them away and sharing them away. And Bible studies, again, one-on-one, -on -one, one in groups. But they had the printed page now. Then in 1929, not the medium, but on that medium called radio, we began a program called The Voice of Prophecy. 
taking the good news of salvation by means of radio waves to bigger masses, bigger people, bigger groups of people, but still restricted to a particular geographical area. As far as the radio beams could go, and as many people as had radios, they could listen to the voice of prophecy, preach the Bible and the gospel of Jesus Christ. That was 1929, before my time. But then we moved on and they developed and they discovered and the television set. 1950, Faith for Today began broadcasting via television. So now we have the printed page, we have tracks, we have radio, and now we have television. And then just a few years later, It Is Written was formulated, founded, and began to broadcast It Is Written. The Bible says, and he would quote the scriptures and share with all the listeners via television. And by that time, the television was becoming to be a big thing. People wanted to get a television. Everybody wanted a TV, but not everybody had one. So those who had it could hear it. But then in a few years later, we just learned how to make film. So they made film. They were reel-to-reel. I remember when they used reel-to-reel projectors. And they made films like John Huss, historical figures in the proclamation of the gospel who gave his life because he said the Bible says and I hear I stand and I can't change my way show me from the Bible where I'm wrong please they couldn't but they killed him so the film of John Huss was made and that became a very powerful means of sharing the, the importance of having a real solid relationship with Jesus Because the Bible or the historical record says when John Huss was tied to the stake and then then he set the the brush, the logs, the fire underneath him, he began to sing. And he died singing. Jesus, the son of Mary, have mercy on me. And then we move on from film. Now we have the printed page. We have radio. We have TV. Now we have films that we're making to share the gospel. But then we moved on to something else where they had new developments of how, of technology. And I remember when they developed the 8-track. And within a few years, it went from 8-track to cassette. And then from cassettes to CDs. And from CDs to VHS. And from VHS to DVDs. And so we use all those media methods to record the gospel on cassette then you could buy the entire evangelistic series on cassette but you only could hear the audio but as time developed and they came from cassette and they moved to CDs you can get less CDs with the same amount of material and share the gospel via audio but then they came up with the DVD where they put film and pictures with the audio so you could watch and listen to the proclamation of the gospel We're developing and it's going to the world, but still restricted to time and geographical areas. But God is going to fix that. As we continue down, back back in early 1990s, we had a program we called Net Programs. I think Mark Finley was the first one to pioneer that area where they used this satellite technology and now they can reach further geographical areas. And they don't have to be restricted to a North America. They could also beam down to South America and Central America and Europe and Africa from satellites out there in space. So you use satellite technology to beam the gospel to the world. You know, I used to believe when I was a kid growing up and then I started into the ministry and I was looking at the way the population is growing and I would ask myself, Lord, how on earth are we going to be able to reach an entire generation at one time with the gospel before you come. People were being born faster than we could keep up with. And then they would die. I mean, they was born 10 and died 5. But the population kept growing. How are we going to reach them, Lord? I used to ask. Don't ask that anymore. You see, we've gone from satellite technology 
to internet technology. Internet is not just slow, meticulous, I watch it develop over the years. And the first time we got it was very, very slow compared to today. When we first got the internet, we couldn't run audio and visual presentations because it was just too slow. Now you can send emails, and you can send text messages, kind of things, those types of things, short messages, and it would go around the world in seconds. But today, God has allowed man to develop the internet to such a point where we can now beam this program. If people have access to the internet today, and they can be in Australia, they can be in Britain, they can be in Russia, they can be in New Guinea, they can be in Africa, and they all can listen to me live today. If they have the right connection, if they're going to the right site at the right time. And now we have it so we don't even have to be there at a given time. Just know that it's there and so I can go and watch it at my leisure. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached as a witness unto all nations, and then the end will come. So the internet has been a phenomenal medium by which God is reaching out to the world and sharing the gospel. And my Bible says, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness. It does not say that the whole world is going to be converted the whole world is going to accept it, but they're going to have it provided for them. It's going to be preached to them, made available to them. What they do with it is their choice. Consequences are accepted. Commit your life to Christ and prepare for his second coming. And when he comes, we get to go to be with him. And there's no more COVID-19s or anything like it. There are no more influenzas or anything like it. No more disease, no more pestilence, period. Not in God's kingdom. Because those things are the result of sin. And sin is a terrible thing, even though men seem to enjoy it sometimes. You know, when I was, and I mentioned this just a minute ago, how I used to marvel at how we're going to do this. But I don't anymore. God has made a way for us to share the gospel. And I want to say today that the gospel is being preached to the world today for the last several years like it has never, ever been preached before. Why this text? Because my Bible says, and is going to be proclaimed to the world as a witness to all nations and then it says, and then the end will come. That end is when Jesus comes. So my understanding would be that at any given time, God can say, it's time, son, to Jesus. Go bring our children home. We're also told that things will get pretty rough before they get better. But I want you to know that God is able to take care of his children. He's able to take care of his children. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 37 says this, For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Doesn't say he might come, he could come. Again, the strong word, he will come and he will not tarry. So when God's time clock strikes it's time, be it 12 o'clock, be it 1 o'clock, be it 2 o'clock, when he's set to come back for us, when it hits the time, he's coming. He's coming. Yes, Jesus is coming as soon as possible for, and I believe it's quite possible. I can't promise this because the Bible, Jesus is very clear. Nobody knows the day or the hour. But he did say one thing that is important to us. Jesus never said, tell me how much you love me. He never said to us that we should 
wait till we almost see him coming and then get ready. He said, be ready. And the reason being is, he says, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man comes. In other places, it says he'll come as a thief in the night. You know, thieves are not expected. You don't plan for them. I've had that ungodly experience. You come in to work. I was teaching school. Went in one morning. I used to go early. I got to the office and the door was open. What on earth? And I opened the door and lo and behold, somebody had been through our files, the computers that we had and got into the classroom and taken them out. And there's a terrible feeling that goes through your stomach. You're just like it's going to drop. So we called the police and they came and we finally got the persons involved. But the fact remains is when we have someone invade our space, it is not good. He will come and he may come in our lifetime. So we need to be ready. Jesus said that over and over again. Be ready. I'm coming when you don't expect me to come. And here the Bible says, you can know you're almost there when the gospel has been preached to all the world. Uh, let me share this now. Last night, Friday night, we began a first time event in the history of the Adventist church when it comes to sharing the gospel. First time. We're giving a evangelistic series via the internet. And last I heard, because the people have to sign up, in other words, they need to register for the site. I want to be there. So they go to amazing, no, hopeawakens.com, hopeawakens.com, and they put their name and their phone number and their email. That's it. And last I heard, there were 50,000 people had it registered already. And the number's growing. So I don't know what it's going to be when we start, when we started last night, exactly. And I intend, I anticipate it will grow as we go through the series from last night till May 16. We have a, a working party of 1,700 plus virtual Bibles instructors. To minister to these people. And that number is growing. And so we have the evidence today that God's declaration that the gospel is to be preached in all the world is taking place. Therefore, my conclusion is Jesus will come soon. Maybe, and I hope, in our lifetime. Now, let me share this. Some people are terrified when you talk about Jesus coming. They shouldn't be, but they are. And the only reason that they are is because they're not prepared. Let me illustrate. If you're driving down the street, and the speed limit says 60, you're out, periphery of the city, or in between cities, for whatever reason, you're coming into an area where the average speed limit may be 70, 75, and you've dropped it to 60. But you're in a hurry. So you continue your already illegal speed of 85. So you're doing 85 miles an hour in a 60-mile speed zone. And lo and behold, you see a highway patrol car. How do you feel? Scared. Did he see me? Oh, yes. And then if you go, when you get past him and you see red lights behind you, you don't feel so good. Why? Broke the law. There's a consequence. Pulls you over and gives you a ticket. Could be, take your license. Who broke the law? You did. The policeman's just doing his job, trying to keep the community safe, keep us within speed limits. Change the scenario. 
it is now late at night. You're traveling maybe back home or on a trip. Traveling the speed limit, fine. It's dark. And your car hiccups and dies. There's no lights that you can see anywhere in the distance. How do you feel? Anxious? Maybe scared? Concerned for sure. What's wrong with my car? I'm out here in no man's land. And then a highway patrolman pulls up. How do you feel? Ah, relief. Help is here. He'll help me. That's his job. And he does. Notice a different reaction to the same person or the same vehicle. In one circumstance, I'm terrified. In the other circumstance, I'm rejoicing. Why? Because in the second circumstance, I have a need. I'm not breaking the law. And the patrolman becomes my savior. Jesus is our savior. When we give our life to him and he takes away all the bad stuff in our life now. But if we wait until he returns, still practicing that bad stuff, whatever it might be, we're terrified. One other simple illustration. I want to ask you to think. And I'm thinking most of you who are watching or listening today, you have had this experience. How many of you have ever burned your fingers trying to start a fire with a match? Think about that. Have you ever had the experience where you've burned your fingers trying to start a fire? Maybe you're going to barbecue, you're going to do whatever, and you burned your fingers. Ah, it hurt. Why did you burn your fingers? Because you like to hurt? Nope. There's only one reason that I can come up with that we burn our fingers. And I've had that experience, by the way, so I know. There's only one reason why we burned our fingers trying to, learn to light a match, light, light a fire with a match. We held on to the match too long. That's the only reason. You saw the fire coming towards your fingers as it burned, but you just want to get that last little bit of benefit. Oh, and it got me. Sin will cause us to be burned. Jesus' job is to take away the sin. So when the fires are given, sent, Rain down when he comes in his power and glory. The glory can pass through us and not take our life. Because when he consumes the sin and we're holding on to it, it's going to consume us too. That's why the gospel is recognize the sin. Give it to God by confessing it and then leave it alone. Stop practicing that sin. But how do I know it's a sin? I have to read God's word. And the devil's very busy to get us so busy we don't have time to read God's word. Time is up. It wouldn't be right for me to quit now and say, Jesus is coming soon. You better get ready. Well, yes, you better get ready. Because when, we're, when, he's, when his clock hits time to go, he's coming whether I'm ready or you're ready or not. But we can be ready today. All we got to do is, as 
John says it so well. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And I love the last part. And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's why Jesus died. So he could say to me, and he could say to you, I love you. I can forgive you. Leave the sin alone. Jesus says, if you love me, do what I say. Our parents or our children demonstrate their love to us when they do what we say as parents. God is our Heavenly Father. Jesus is our best friend. And we love him. We just do what he says as recorded in his word. So today I'd like to leave this idea with you. If you haven't made that decision, get on your knees and say, Lord, I'm sorry for my sins. And I would like to encourage you to be specific. You lied. You cheated. You shudder at your husband, your wife, your child. You stole something. You used drugs. You drink. Whatever your issue, confess that to God. Be specific. And then ask him to help you to not do that again. And then thank him for the victory that he'll give you in Christ. Last verse for today. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I want to read that one verse that I love so much. 57, almost to the end of the chapter. And it says, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Today we look at two signs. Those are pestilence. We're living in a pestilence right now. Two, the proclamation of the gospel. It is taking place like now, right now, as never, ever before. And the promise is, when it's proclaimed to the world as a witness, then the end will come. If we're ready or we're not. And my Bible says again, today is the day of salvation. If you hear God speaking to your heart, it says, don't turn away. Surrender it. And he'll give you the victory that only he can give for all of us. Let's pray. Lord, you know, we know you're coming. Some believe that and some don't. But it's believing that makes a change in our life. John said, if we have this hope, everyone that has this hope purifies himself, even as you are pure. We can't change ourselves. We just have to surrender ourselves to you and actually, Lord, do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. You want us to be a part of your kingdom. You want that with a passion. But you never force us. You're almighty God, but you leave the choice to us. Help us to choose life by choosing to give our lives to Jesus just today. And then make that a choice every morning. Lord, just today, I'm going to try by your grace to live for you. I want to honor you just one day at a time until I can see you face to face. Thank you for hearing our prayer. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for Jesus' love and for the soon coming hope that we have. Because we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.